Hello, and welcome to Confronting Injustice. I am your host, Linda Solomon, joined by our co-host, James Watson, as we discuss the injustices of the criminal legal system. Our guest today is Professor Deborah Sharif. She is a filmmaker, documentary maker, educator, entrepreneur, and business coach. <laughs> um, and so we thank you for being here with us. Oh, thank you for having me. Thank Absolutely. you for inviting me. Absolutely. Um, as this is Black History Month, and in celebration of Black History Month, we thought it was important to share information about black history that people may not be aware of. And so with all the extensive research that you've done, we thought you'd be a perfect guest. So we're looking forward to you sharing information about your research and the documentary that you made. Um, but we'd like to start with you giving us a little information about background information about yourself. Absolutely, you thank you, Linda and James. Well, I grew up in Boston, okay. and I'm, you know, a product of the Civil Rights era. Uh, I also grew up in the south end of Boston, and I am proud to say that I was 15 years old when I m marched with Dr. Martin Luther King back in the day. Nice. It was an honor. Um, and I became really interested in black history when I was like about 9 or 10 years old. And we were gathered around the table. Uh, and I, I, I'll never forget this, was my grandfather and my grandma, mm -hmm. my elder aunts and uncles, and they started talking about the fact that we were related to black Indians. And, and I guess at this juncture, do you mind if I ask them to put up the first slide? Absolutely. So here I am sitting around the table, right, mm -hmm. with the elders, and they're telling me that we are related to Native Americans. And so I'm thinking, and I'm just gonna show you a couple of slides, if we can show the, the next slide so the audience can actually see um, the fact that there were black Indians. And a lot of people are not familiar with the fact that there were natives of African descent. Mm -hmm. And I'm just showing a couple of slides of black Indians. And these, these photos are very, very old. We're talking 1700s, 1600s, wow. et cetera. And you can see the colors, uh, you know, that they actually wore. And again, it's just something that's just not known. Uh, and you can see that. Now, this is a slide that I'm showing because being a young person, about nine years old, in the 50s, mm -hmm. I'm saying, wait a minute, my aunt and uncle told me that I actually was related to black Indians. And I heard my grandfather, he used to say, yeah, Choctaw, Cherokee. And I'm saying, wow, that's cool, you know? Mm -hmm. But then when I watched television with my brother Rick, I noticed that all of the Indians were white. Mm -hmm. And I said, they don't look like my grandfather. They don't look like me. So what is the issue? So that was something that stayed with me forever. It was sort of something that I wanted to know the truth okay. about the fact that my elders were telling me that I'm related to black Indians, but the proof on television, of course, you know, back in the day when you were a kid, mm -hmm. you believe everything on television. Absolutely. I, and I'm, I'm asking the question to you all, did you all get the same sense? Did you know that there were black Indians when you all were younger? Absolutely not, absolutely not. No, I, no, I, no, I didn't. And, you know, it, it, it's something that is really interesting because when I talk to people, they usually say, oh yeah, yeah, my grandmother back in the day, she was telling me that we were uh, related to Pequot mm -hmm. or Wampanoid. And I'm saying, oh my goodness, is that true? So I just want to actually show this next slide, if I may. And Deb, let me just say, you know, it's interesting sure. that my family um, has, is Cherokee Indian from Frogtown in Georgia, wow. in, in Savannah. You never told me that. <laughs> it's interesting because when you just asked me about that, I said no. But when I thought of Native Americans, I didn't think necessarily black. I'm not sure why. Probably the way I was socialized, or, you know, we're all socialized, so. Um, but yeah, yeah, I have, um, yeah, they, yeah. Wow, when I was in Georgia, I went to visit the 
Cherokee village. Mm. And I was talking to a gentleman by the name of George. He was Cherokee. And so I asked him, I said, um, uh, are there any black Cherokees that live in Georgia? He said, yes, but they mm. keep to themselves. And so I just thought that that was pretty interesting. Yeah. Because again, the confusion set in for me as a nine-year-old kid, okay, you know, my grandparents and my elders are telling me that, um, you know, that we're related to black uh, Indians, et cetera. But again, the confusion was the white Indians on television, more specifically, and I know the young group probably don't know John Wayne, but some of the folks in the control room, I know they know who I'm talking about, yeah. but John Wayne, um, actually, I used to watch all, I, I used to love cowboy and Indian movies. And guess who we rooted for? No. The cowboys. Right, right. Absolutely. Yes. So, so it was sort of like a quest. So when I actually attended college, I majored, mm. I actually majored in black studies. Okay. And unfortunately, when I majored in black studies, there wasn't, not a peep, not a sentence, not a book that talked about black Indians. It wasn't until later on in life when I ran into, and I'm, I'm gonna show um, this, uh, actually this book by William Lauren Katz, and it was called Black Indians. And I said, oh my goodness, my, my elders and my family, they were not lying. There are black Native Americans. And I was really thrilled. So I did a deep search on William Lauren Katz's book and that's what led me to the fact of the Maroon settlements. Okay. So not only were black Indians around during the 16, 17, 1800s, but we also, there were free black Native Americans as well. And so I'm trying to put the two together. I said, okay, found out that there are black Indians, mm -hmm. but now they're talking about the Atlantic slave trade so I'm saying, okay, how does that connect? Because if we were the first natives in this land, what happened to us? Mm -hmm. And what about the, the African slave trade? Well, believe it or not, and I'm gonna show you the next slide, this gentleman who is Ivan Van Sertema, mm -hmm. he actually authored a book called uh, oh goodness, I'm, <laughs> it's almost because I'm on television, um, before the Mayflower. Right, right. And uh, this was really interested. And matter of fact, I'm going to see if I can, no, I'll leave this here. But Van Sertema, he actually did a deep research on the fact that we were here thousands of years ago. And so I'm saying, okay, if we were already here, well, first of all, how did we get here? Because I only heard about Columbus, you know, exploring the world. I only heard about the Portuguese exploring the world. But guess what? Next slide. And this was during the Ramesse uh, three. We're talking 400 BC that Africans were magnificent navigators. Mm -hmm. So I think it's pretty arrogant of the history books just to act like there was only, or to say that there was only one ethnic group that was doing the exploration. Right. That's crazy. Yes. Look at these beautiful boats that they made. And they were navigators, they were explorers, and they- Shipbuilders. Shipbuilders. Built ships. That's right. Absolutely. And the next slide shows a modern day uh, where they actually, um, you know, they recreated the, the ships that uh, came from Africa, which I thought was really interesting. And another evidence of this, again, this is uh, Vadima, this is, I'm sorry, um, <laughs> I'm forgetting his name, Ivan Van Sertema. Right. This, is, this comes from his book, and, which was really fascinating. And as you can see, here is the next slide where you see the Almacs. The Almacs were found in Mexico. And as you can also see, the gentleman there that is, and I have to get a little bit closer to the screen so I can see, Alexander von Wathenau. He, he, yes, he was a German scholar, an archeologist. He mm -hmm. spent 20 years in Mexico. And this is what he actually found during his excavation. He found these Negroid heads. And there's no denial, I'm just gonna show the next slide. And you can see there's no denial that these are African people. Mm -hmm. 
So, you, so the discussion, and we can you know, come back into the discussion, is if we were here thousands of years ago, then what does that say in terms of our history books? Mm. You know, I'm thinking that my ancestors got here dur you know, during the slave trade. And I'm saying that there were Africans that came from Africa during the right. Atlantic slave trade, but not as many as one may think. Mm. So that is something new. Yeah. I'm saying, what? Interesting. I'm saying, what, are you serious? And if that was the case, then my next question is, so what happened to them? What happened to those communities of Native mm -hmm. Americans, that, of black people, mm -hmm. that were the true Native Americans? Some of the pictures that I showed. Well, here's something that did happen. And I just want to show this slide. They came before Columbus. So <laughs> I, I think I made a mistake and said they came before the Mayflower. But uh, we can, historians can make mistakes, but they came before the Columbus, and if you want to do your own research, you can actually look up uh, Ivan Van Sertimer's book for that, and I just want to show you another uh, book, African and Native Americans, which I think is really cool, The Language of Race and the Evolution of Red Black People, and that was Jack D. Forbes, uh, so I've had these books forever. So in this next slide, we are talking about what happened to the free blacks, what happened to the first natives. Well, a lot of them, because of discrimination and because of the settlers that came to North America to settle, they just did not like us in our territory. And the other thing that happened was the fugitive slave law. And what that was, this was actually implemented and passed by Congress. And what it, would, what it meant is that a lot of enslaved Africans, of course, they escaped the cruelty of the plantation. Mm. And when they did, guess where they went? They went to the woods. They went to the forest. Mm -hmm. They went to places where actually where their white enemies could not find them. So they went to these obscure places. Now, the free Africans, unfortunately, even though they had papers, the bottom line is, they were sort of, oh my goodness, you know, they are actually kidnapping or they're coming back, you know, some of the slave masters in the South, if they could not find the original slave that had escaped, guess who they would, who they would kidnap? Oh, no. Yeah, the free, free blacks. Slaves, yeah, and we, I the think we're familiar with that movie. Um, I, I'm so glad you mentioned and that. If yeah. we can see the next slide. <laughs> Boom. 12, Twelve years a slave. Right. Yeah. That was an amazing movie about how they kidnapped a free black man. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't the only free black that they actually kidnapped. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's miraculous that we even heard about that story. But before you go on, I have to say, you know, it's interesting that I'm familiar um, there's been a tremendous amount of research about the history of black people. What you've demonstrated is some. And so I would encourage people to do their research because you have to wonder, or I wonder, that people just forget to put this in the history books. Why is it that we don't know? Well, let you me... You know, it's... Yeah. It just... It, um, it it's goes just beyond back to your drama, your trauma training. Mm. I mean, if people don't know who they are, then you can certainly take away their power. Right. So if you make a people powerless and they don't know who they are, then they, they're easily controlled. Absolutely. And they feel they have no credibility. I mean, no, mm -hmm. no, I want to hear from you, James. Yes, I've been yeah. running. They feel they have no credibility, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Their worth, their self-esteem is all is shattered. You know, mm -hmm. Because they don't know. Absolutely. And, and just think that this quest, I mean, how would I even come up with the fact of searching this truth out had it not been for my elders mm -hmm. when I was a kid, sitting around the table, mm -hmm. you know, listening to the elders, respecting what they're saying, and saying, and, I, you know, we respected our elders back in the day. So it was really hard for me to, you know, to fathom or to understand well, if my grandpa, which we used to call grandpa, mm. I said, if my grandpa said that we were related to black Indians, Blackfoot, Peacock, mm. Cherokee, then we were related to them. 
So the television, of course, it was huge. And so how would I, you know, look at that? And, that? But it was something that was inside of me that I knew that my elders were telling me the truth. Mm. So seeking out that information, other than that, I mean, going to, you know, a black studies course, I mean, I majored in African-American studies in college, and I asked the professors about, they didn't know anything. They had no clue because they were miseducated right. as yeah. well. They were well, miseducated. Let me, let me say this, and then I'll let you get back to, um, to the presentation. Carter G. Whitten, who's responsible for Black History Month, said he dedicated his life to exposing, educating people about this because he did not want the history of black people to become a negligible factor in the thought of the world. And by us not knowing that information, not being taught, is it, so his fear was actually be, be, is being actualized or was being actualized. People didn't know. Correct, correct. Um, and we can talk more about him later, but um, his concern was legitimate. Absolutely, I mean, we honor him. You know, they call him the father of black history along with Dr. John Henrik Clark, mm -hmm. who also wrote extensively about black natives and about the history of black people. Mm -hmm. And so, so we're at a juncture right now and we're thinking about, okay, the fact that free blacks and enslaved Africans are being treated cruelly here in this country. And so it was the blacks that took it upon themselves, because you know, I hear a lot of black people, I mean, I've been an educator for many years, and my students used to say, oh, professor, if, I, if that was me back in the day, I would have, I said, you would have what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I would have escaped the plantation. I said, you know what, that's exactly what your ancestors did. Mm -hmm. Not only did they escape the plantation, but guess what they did? They found it, and I'm gonna show um, this next uh, clip which is called the Maroons. Many people are not familiar with the Maroons, mm -hmm. but I'm gonna uh, actually show this next uh, slide, which shows that what happened is hundreds of enslaved Africans, free and enslaved, they took to the mountains. Mm -hmm. They said, we're not staying mm -hmm. here. They were Maroons that were created by Africans and Native Americans, mm -hmm. enslaved Africans. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing, and I'm just going to show you the next slide, which shows these were villages that Africans had created where they were actually hidden away from their white enemies. And here is another one. I like this one because you see how they had underground openings mm -hmm. where all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're actually, you look at a rock and you don't know that behind that rock is a hidden mm -hmm. And, and we're talking about the, under, it's almost like the underground world. Yeah, that's what it sounds like. But these were underground hidden communities that were called Maroons. And I'm just gonna show you as we get to the villages, here are some of the villages of the Maroons. And here is a mom where her family lived free, because you know African women, uh, they actually saw their children be sold, being sold away. So having these villages and having this free, the next slide, um, as you can see, um, you know, a father and uh, the, you know, the parents, the a father family. and a mother mm -hmm. and her children and her baby, you know, they all, they escaped. Mm -hmm. They wanted to be free. And here is the next slide where you can see uh, the villages, and I, and I just want to finish up with, with this. Um, here is a book that, the next slide, if you can see, Slavery in Exile, and uh, Sylvia Dovoff, and I hope I'm not, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing her name correctly, but mm -hmm. she wrote a book that talked extensively about African people that were actually, that actually created maroon settlements. And some of the Maroon settlements, believe it or not, were just uh, enslaved Africans. And some of them was a combination oh. of Native Americans, black mm. Native Americans. I mean, it was, it was just an altogether different look back in the mm. day. And her book is really, really good. And I'm just gonna kind of close, I'm almost at the conclusion okay. so we can talk about other things. Um, I'm just showing you that picture about this nine-year-old girl, who would have thought that this nine-year-old girl's information from her elders would create a lifelong journey of trying to find the truth mm -hmm. about her people. So what I did on the next slide, 
I actually authored a book for young people that's called The Maroon Settlement. So there won't be another nine or 10 year old little girl wondering and mm -hmm. being confused. What? We were actually there back in the day? Mm -hmm. So it talks about the Maroon nice. Settlement. Mm -hmm. And as we close, and I just also want to share that I, when I uh, attended Boston University's graduate film program, in this next slide, the New England community was flabbergasted. They said they didn't know anything about it. We shot our film, the student film, mm -hmm. in Peabody and Malden, where they had period homes. Mm -hmm. And the newspapers, they had a frenzy. They said, wow, this was back in the 90s, okay. Mm -hmm. They said, oh, she's a black woman director and writer. Oh, my goodness. The Boston Globe, the Herald. And if you can show that slide, you can see all the different newspapers, wherever we shot, they did a front page story on the student that actually shot this thesis film, which nice. meant that the, the community, the New England community was hungry for the truth as well. And I, I, yes, and I just wanna show this next slide because the students have a ball with that. They said, Professor, you actually shot that film and you were directing, you see I have a Malcolm X t-shirt. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm actually directing that particular film. And yes. that's actually the last slide. So that is sort of my story, um, all the way from being a nine-year-old kid, being curious about my people, and discovering a part of history that not many people know about. That's right. Maroon settlement, maroon communities, because they were actually thriving communities. They were. And they're still around to this day. Nice. Uh, which is nice. really interesting. I'm saying, whoa. I want to visit, and I actually want to visit those maroon settlements as well. Well, well, we'll have to yeah. go with you because I want to visit as well. <laughs> um, but thank you for sharing. The, the, you know, there's so many, there's so much in that presentation. So we're talking about um, Africans being sailors, shipbuilders, merchants, way before Columbus. In fact, Columbus had um, Africans on his black um, moors yes. on his ships and then the history of um the fact that the slaves in the um some slaves and then some free black people worked um together with native americans to form these communities yes. so they were safe havens they were that's they were exactly, safe havens. that's how they describe them in the book they mm -hmm. were safe havens i mean i i mean i always like try to picture myself. I mean, I, I feel the souls of my ancestors whenever I start writing about the Maroon Settlements, which I'm writing a full-length screenplay right now. Nice. Um, and it's really interesting because I can feel the souls of them. Yes, our story is finally being told. And that really, that invigorates me, that, that excites me. Listen. It's empowering. Yes. Oh, man, it's really empowering. It really is. It really is. It's interesting that you would say the soul, your soul, like, I feel like the ancestors are crying out for information to be shared. But we don't have much time. I wanted to share a little bit about Carter G. Woodson and Henrietta Lacks. So Carter G. Woodson um, is responsible for, responsible for Black History Month. It started as a week and then is now a month. He was the child of plantation of former slaves. He didn't go to school until he was about 18 and 19. At 20, he earned his high school diploma. Um, and went off to college, learned English. I mean, he spoke English, but he learned many different languages on his own in between working in coal mines. But he dedicated his entire life to um, educating people, publishing um, information about the history of black people for a very legitimate reason. Um, and so I encourage people to, and you know, you have to wonder, we've been study, studying about Black History Month since I can remember, and nine out of 10 people do not know who Carter G. Woodson is. And so you have to ask, did teachers, did educators just forget to teach, what was that about, one? And then another person that we should know about is um, Henrietta Lacks. Um, this woman, her, for a long time, the medical industry was trying to um, duplicate cells, right? And they couldn't do it, they just couldn't do it. And this woman, black woman, had cancer. She eventually died from that cancer, but the medical profession realized they took a piece of her, took right. some of her cells, 
and they realized that they could regenerate them, and they couldn't do that before. Mm -hmm. And so people throughout the world now are using her cells for research. The fact that most people don't know about that is incredible. The stunning thing is, well, two, one, that they're, with, they're doing something they couldn't do before and it came from this black woman. The other thing is they did this, they took her cells without telling her. And so it wasn't until many years later that her family found out what was going on. And so they now, if you do any research, you'll see that her family talks about it, but like across the entire world, her cells are being used. Um, and so that's miraculous. And let me, one it's other- It's a movie that Oprah, Oprah played Henrietta. Mm -hmm. And so it's, I, I believe it was on HBO. So if people yeah. want to check out they the movie- They absolutely should. And then the last thing I'll say is, um, the mathematician who I was responsible for this, um, one of the space shuttles going up in the early um, 60s, to sta 60s um, this, one of the space shuttles was going up and the astronaut who was in charge of, you know, who was there said, I'm not going up until I get her coordinates. And the coordinates were from a black woman who was a mathematician. And so there are people that we need to know about. It's not just black people need to know about, people need to know about. If we're gonna talk about history, let's talk about the whole history, not just selective pieces of it. And so this show was, is an invitation to just rethink your narrative, to do some research, and let's you know, sort of come together and, and see how we can make these connections because it should bring us closer together. Deb, I wanna thank you for being here and sharing this information about the Maroons. Thank you, thank um, you. And thank you, Braintree Public Access, for having me as well. Yes. And I want to thank uh, Meredith. <laughs> Meredith, the, um, she's a city council woman here in Braintree who reached out and um, inquired about, you know, doing something for Black History Month. Um, and so I just want to kudos out to her. Um, and so thank you to our guests, Deborah Sharif, for being here today. Thank you for watching Confronting Injustice. And... We look forward to seeing the audience next okay. time. Thank you. Very